Today we have this really cool second order nonlinear differential equation. And the first thing to notice here is that the x term is missing explicitly. So we can make use of one of my favorite transformations. And that is letting the first derivative dy by dx equal to some other variable u. Now this implies that d square y by dx squared equals du by dx. And the problem is that if I use these transformations in this form, then my differential equation will contain three variables, y, x, and u, which is, of course, problematic, but there's a way to work around this. We can write du by dx as du by dy times dy by dx. And dy by dx is just the u variable, so this implies that the second derivative of y with respect to x transforms into u, times du by dy. So making use of these transformations, the structure of your differential equation now is this y times the second derivative becomes a y times u times du by dy minus the square of the first derivative, so that's u squared, and on the right you have 4y squared times log y. And now for some rearrangement. We can write this as y times u du, minus, or let's write it with a positive sign, plus minus uh, u squared minus 4y squared log y dy equal to zero. And this structure motivates us to check whether or not this is an exact differential equation. So let's take this term and differentiate it partially with respect to y. So in this case, you get a u term. And if you differentiate this bad boy with respect to u partially, then you'll get a negative 2u term. So the two partial derivatives are not equal and the equation is not an exact one yet. I'm saying yet because it's pretty easy to turn this into an exact differential equation. Notice that you have to differentiate this partially with respect to y and this thing partially with respect to u. So this troublesome 4y squared log y term is not troublesome at all. It just vanishes when you differentiate partially with respect to u, right? And I also have a negative sign with the u squared. A good choice here would be to divide by u cubed. So that gives us y divided by u squared plus all of this stuff divided by y cubed. And if you differentiate partially with respect to y, u divided by y squared, then you get a negative 2u divided by y cubed. And if you differentiate all of this partially with respect to u, then again you get a negative 2u divided by y cubed. And the two partial derivatives are equal, making this structure an exact differential equation. Now the perk of being an exact differential equation is that the left-hand side sorts out to being the differential f of a function u and y. And the right-hand side is zero, which implies that f of u and y is some constant of integration c. And all that's left now is to determine the structure of the function f. And that's pretty easy. Because the left-hand side is the differential of the function f, this means that the term attached to the du term is in fact the partial derivative with respect to u of the function f. And this term here is in fact partial f by partial y. So we can make use of these two new differential equations starting off with uh, partial f by partial u being equal to u by y squared. So all we have to do is integrate with respect to u holding the y term constant, of course. So this implies that we have f of u and y equal to u squared by 2y squared plus some function g of y. And to determine the function g, we can partially differentiate this structure here with respect to y because we know exactly what it sorts out to, correct? So on partial differentiation, we have partial f by partial y being equal to negative u squared by y cubed plus the derivative of g with respect to y. And now taking a look at our differential equation again, we see that indeed we have this negative u squared by y cubed term, and we also have this negative 4y squared log y divided by y cubed. 
So on comparison, we find that the derivative of g with respect to y equals negative 4y squared log y divided by y cubed, where the y squared cancels out pretty nicely with the term in the denominator, and this, imp this implies that the derivative with respect to y of g equals negative 4 log y divided by y. So on integration with respect to y, we have g of y being equal to negative 4 times the square of the logarithm of y. So we have the structure of our function f of u and y. This equals u squared divided by 2y squared minus 4 times log square y. And this equals some constant c. Again, we need some rearrangements, and we can write this as u squared being equal to c plus 4 times the squared logarithm of y, all multiplied by 2y squared. And multiplying out the 2 here means that we have 8 times the squared logarithm of y. And we can just absorb the c, uh, absorb the 2 into the constant c, because 2 times c is, again, just another constant. And square rooting means that we have two solutions corresponding to the positive and negative square roots, correct? So we have plus minus y times the square root of 8 times log square y plus c. And recall that u here is just the derivative of y with respect to x, meaning that you have a nice separable differential equation, which can be written as dy divided by 8 times, oh, sorry about that, y times the square root of 8 times the squared logarithm of y plus the constant c. And on the right, you just have dx. So integrating both sides means that you have, on the right-hand side, x plus another constant of integration, c sub 1. And the left can be integrated using a simple substitution by letting log y equal to phi, which implies the 1 by y, terribly sorry, 1 by y dy equals d phi. So this implies that, oh, do not forget the plus and minus signs. You have plus minus integral d phi divided by the square root of 8 phi squared, again, terribly sorry, plus the constant of integration c. And on the right, all you have is x plus c sub 1. And the left-hand side is now just a standard anti-differentiation problem, which sorts out to 1 by the square root of 8, times the inverse cinch of phi times the square root of 8 divided by c sub 1. Oh, wait, it's just the constant c. We have c sub 1 on the right-hand side. So all that's left now is to clean up the mess, meaning that we have on the right-hand side plus minus x times the square root of 8. And again, we can absorb the square root of 8 into the constant c sub 1 because it's just another constant and you have the inverse cinch on the left, meaning that you need the hyperbolic sign of all of this stuff, and you're left with phi times the square root of 8 divided by c. So just multiply that out, and you get uh, the square root of c divided by 8 times the hyperbolic sign of all that stuff, and this is phi in terms of x. And phi is, in fact, the logarithm of y. So using exponentials, we have an explicit solution for y in terms of x, meaning that we can write y as e to the square root of c divided by 8. Again, this can be written as just another constant c times the hyperbolic sine of plus minus the square root, uh, plus minus x times the square root of 8 plus c sub 1. And this was pretty damn cool. And I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.